we are thankful and grateful that you are joined to us today through uh, this means of technology and that you're worshiping with us to praise God and give thanks for God's faithfulness to us. We have been talking for the last several weeks about the capital campaigns that are going on for Camp Agape, Curie Beach, as well as Luther Ridge and Luther Rock here in North Carolina. Both of these outdoor ministry programs, as well as all four sites, have been part of the ministry here at St. James for many years. And so we want to support them and help them out. Now, one of the things that sometimes happens is we don't really know the stories. We don't know all the people. We just know the places or know the names. So here's uh, a small uh, part, an edited uh, video from someone whose faith was shaped and whose God, who, who God impacted uh, while he had time at Luther Ridge. Hey there, folks. Uh, pastor Daniel Locke here, uh, serve as pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, 2007, uh, I was in college, and my mom had died in January. Um, and I was kind of lost, didn't know what to do or where to go or who to be or what God was doing. And to be honest, God and I weren't best of friends at the moment. And so that summer, my dad was a pastor and took his youth uh, up to camp for camp formation. It was week two of summer camp. I didn't know what to do, and Dad said, well, why don't you come up to camp for a day or two? You know, you can crash on my extra bed or the floor of my room in Thornburg and um, and, and hang out um, and meet some pastors, meet some other folks, um, probably know a few counselors up there to say hi to and, and hang out with kids and just uh, not sit at home. So I said, yeah, and I did. I was a stowaway at camp for a few days, and to be honest, I probably owe Luther Ridge a bit of registration um, from 13 years ago. Um, and while I was there, I got to meet a lot of the pastors in dad's group, uh, met a lot of counselors and watched them at work. Uh, and a lot of the kids, uh, who opened up in the week and, and saw the spirit flowing through them that all these kids who come from such different places, um, were in the safety of camp and could be who they were, uh, live their truest self, uh, free of judgment or fear of, of criticism or, um, you know, all the things that they, they fear in high school and all the bullying, like let it all go. And at camp, they could be a part of the kingdom and God was at work. Um, it was very inspiring. And one of the most kind of influential moments then um, <clears throat> is uh, one night I sat on the rocking chairs of the porch of the dining hall with some old friends that I had known who were counselors at the time. Uh, and I shared my story. I told them where I was in my grief and my pain and my sorrow and, and my uncertainty about the future and what I was doing and all of these things just laid them out and they listened. Um, and then they told me about camp and how it is a place where all are welcome. Uh, you can be who you are. Uh, it's a place to wrestle with things. Not everyone knows everything and has it all figured out. And it's a place to grow and be challenged and to let God work through you um, and to explore what God might be doing. And through that conversation, I thought, yes, I, I need to be a part of this. Um, even if God and I aren't friends right now, I know the Spirit's moving here, and, and this is a place I need to be. So I went back down to Dad's room, and I sat on the, the edge of the bed, and I said, Dad, this is a place I need to be. This is a place I need to work. Um, I think the Spirit's calling me here. And uh, my dad, shout out, John, um, one of the most pivotal moments, for I think, for our, our relationship in our life, he said, well, you definitely won't work here if you don't go ask. And I was fearful because they were already two weeks into summer. Councils were already trained and there's no way I'll be a part of this staff, right? I have to wait till next year and I can't wait. I, need, I can't wait. So he was right. And the next morning I sat with Pastor Tim, God bless him, outside the dining hall in that old uh, that ruins of a little um, shelter. And I told him my story and who I was and why I was there and what the spirit was moving within me. And I said, is there any way you could use me this summer that I could serve at Luther Ridge? And Pastor Tim, he said, oh, you know, uh, he said, I could use you for about two or three weeks, perhaps, on general duty, um, on some of the busier weeks. He said, I can't pay you, but I'd love to have your help. And I said, yes, absolutely. I'll come scrub toilets and serve food. Uh, I just need to be here. Well, the, I drove home. 
I packed up bags for the summer and I came back uh, by the end of the week. Friday evening, I was on the staff list. Saturday, um, I, I was in part of the staff and Sunday morning, folks said, who are you? And I was on um, from there as a blur. For the next five years, I served on staff from counselor to area director to general duty to um, all kinds of things. And it's been such a blessing. And to be honest, if not for Lutheridge, if not for the hundreds of people my age that I met who are wrestling also with their relationship with God, who are many of them now pastors and my colleagues, if not for the children and their witness of the kingdom at work, um, and the, if it wasn't for camp, I wouldn't be a pastor. Um, I know that for a fact. So I'm deeply grateful for camp, and it's an important part of my call story. I so enough about me for the moment. Uh, I invite you to join me in giving to Lutheridge today. Um, and in light of the light, the fire appeal, I thought maybe I'd play a chorus of light the fire. It seemed appropriate. Uh, so here we go. I stand in your presence, but I fall on my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak, so light the fire. Thank you all. God's peace. We begin our worship today with words of confession, and we rejoice as we hear God's gracious words of forgiveness. Faithful God, have mercy on us, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, God has made us his own. Hear the truth that proclaims, Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Thank you. 
The prayer of the day. Oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dara Laner was unable to do our recording this morning for our first reading, and we are apologize for that, and we hope that she'll be able to do that again soon. Our first reading is from Genesis, the 50th chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of your the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Our reading from Psalms is chapter 103, verses 1 through 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. O Lord, you provide vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. You made known your ways to Moses and your work to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sin, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so you have removed our transgressions from us. As far as a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. Our second reading is taken from Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether I am to live or whether we to die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that we might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? 
for we will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall be, shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. This ends our reading. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew in the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts for his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord gave that slave and released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed a hundred denarii, seized him by the throat and said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience on me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw the other slave into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, in case you've missed it, somehow, the word and the theme for the day is forgiveness. In the Old Testament reading, Joseph has just come to the point of forgiveness for the hurt and the actions that his brothers had done to him years ago. They beat him, they threw him into a pit, they pulled him out of that and sold him into slavery to the Midianites who then sold him into Egypt But God has made something good out of all this mess. And Joseph, in the midst of that, knows that carrying that burden around any longer is not healthy. It's not what God desires. And Joseph forgives. In his letter to the Romans, Paul is writing to folks who are having disputes because should Gentiles and Jews, as they convert, as they come to Christ, as they come to believe in Jesus, should they all become circumcised? Should they all follow the laws of the Jewish history and tradition? Should they eat particular things? Should they avoid particular foods? And Paul reminds them that arguing over it is not the important thing. That judging one another is not their responsibility, but God's responsibility. Their responsibility is to love one another, to forgive one another their hurts, and to proclaim the message of Christ's grace and redemption. The psalmist, the 103rd Psalm, one of my favorites, the psalmist is offering praise to a God who forgives, who is slow to anger, The psalmist reminds us that God does not deal with us according to our sins. God does not repay us based upon the amount of our iniquities. And the gospel of Matthew, (laughs) wow. This is one of those kind of stories that you've probably heard somehow or another if you've never even been to church before. You see, here's Peter trying to figure out this whole thing about being a disciple. 
And not just this thing, that, not just Jesus putting it before him as the word, but Jesus calling him the rock, the, the one upon whom he's going to build the entire church. Peter's heard Jesus talk about building community, about taking up your cross, about forgiving one another, and now he's talking about this imagery of forgiveness. And I can see Peter's mind just almost melting down as he's, as he's thinking through these very scenarios that's already happened to him probably, and scenarios that might happen in the future where he's wronged, where somebody's hurt him, where somebody has said something about him. And he's trying to figure out how it is he figures out that confusion. And he comes to Jesus and says, I, I've, got, I've got a question. I need some clarity here. And now, now, teacher, this is just a hypothetical situation. Totally hypothetical. Suppose that there's somebody who's wronged me, and they don't seem to care. And even after I've said something to them, they do it again. And they keep on doing it. How many times should that person be forgiven? Seven times? As many as seven times? Now understand that seven was a number, at least for the Jewish culture, that represented perfection, completeness, wholeness. So in Peter's mind, seven times would be the total process of forgiveness. You wouldn't need anything beyond that. But Jesus gives this answer that's so ludicrous that Peter probably just dismisses it, maybe. I don't know, Peter, he says. I tell you what, my friend. Seven times seems to be a little bit conservative. How about you try seven times 70? And before Peter could pick his jaw up off the floor... Jesus starts into this parable. He tells about this king, right, who's presented with this debtor who owes him some money to the king. Not just some money, but more money than that guy could earn if he lived for a couple hundred years. The first servant owed the king something like 60 million working days worth of money. He would have to work at the average wage for 60 million days. I mean, he owes the king so much money, it's like the debt of a small country. And then he begs for forgiveness, and the king forgives him, and the man walks out, sees another man who owes him money, a hundred days worth of salary and work, and he won't forgive. Now, in the whole big scheme of things, Jesus is once again using hyperbole to make his point. Something outlandish and so ridiculously large and, and, and big that, that we know he's not specifically talking about 10,000 talents. He's saying, Peter, think about it this way. When you talk about seven times, you're keeping, you're keeping score, aren't you? Okay, so he just did it this time, and last Tuesday he did it, and, uh, and then oh, hey, Friday, he also did it Friday. That's three. So I'm going to keep track of it. And when I get to seven, I'm done. Jesus says, no, you can't do that. You can't be that kind of person about forgiveness. It doesn't work that way, Peter. Now, we could have a very long study about forgiveness, the biblical perspectives, how it gets played out in contemporary society and all of that. We could go on it for weeks and weeks. It's a whole lot more than we can deal with in a 10 or 11 minute sermon. So we're just going to focus on a couple of things. First, I want to think about the context of Matthew's gospel. And then maybe other contexts where we hear these words. Now, Matthew is writing to an audience that's still trying to figure out who's, who's to do what in this Christ-following uh, community. It's a mix. You see, he's, re he's writing 30 or 40 years after Jesus dies. And it's a mix of Romans and other Gentiles and, and Jewish folks and folks who have already become Christians early on. And they're still trying to figure out what it is 
that this is all about and how they're going to be in a Christ-following community. And they have this one thing in common, and that is to believe that Jesus is the one God of the universe that creates, who redeems. And, and that is whether they're coming from a Greek perspective or a Jewish perspective. But when they try to sit down and when they try to figure that out, when they try to figure out all that that involves in being community together, they realize they have different opinions and they have different perspectives and arguments start and divisions create. And certainly when they start arguing and fussing and fighting, everybody needs to pick a side about every argument because this is a net sum game. At the end of the day, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers and you certainly don't want to find yourself at the end of the day on the losing side. I'm sorry, I, I, I got a bit carried away, I think. Okay, maybe that's not exactly how Matthew's audience is living. I'm probably thinking about another place, another time, that might be a little closer to our lives and our hearts. But if there was a time and place like that, it just might be that there would be a lot of things said and done in the name of right and wrong and good and bad. And much of that, if not most of that, will probably be hurtful to somebody. People just might get so angered and emotionally upset about the things that are going on that they lose their sense of rightness, that they would call people names, that they might speak half-truths, they might spread stories without checking their facts fully. They might stop actively listening to other people because they want to say something before they hear something. They might start hurting one another with physical violent actions. They might start creating more divisions than existed originally. And when all of that is going on, when the dust and smoke of dissension and disagreement clears, when the fog and haze of frustration and hate it, hatred and violence lifts, it just might be that the community, or at least large portions of it, lies in waste. Property destroyed. Careers and families and lives ruined. Trust with one another is lost. The present, much less, less to speak of the future, is in jeopardy. And in the midst of that, I can hear Jesus saying through Matthew's words, who will be the first to seek forgiveness? And who will be the first to forgive? When I think about all that goes on in our world today, and I think about these words from Jesus about forgiveness, I can't help but think about Luther. Martin Luther sought forgiveness for his sins day after day, hour after hour, and the more he contemplated his sins, the more remorseful and the more hopeless he became. He felt like such a terrible person that he could never be loved by God. He was unlovable. He was almost like that first one who owed the 60 million denarii. And there was no way he could repay it because the king couldn't forgive it because Luther says, I feel like I'm continually adding on to that debt of sin. But thanks be to God that in the midst of that inner turmoil that Luther was going to, he comes upon this unveiling for himself, this revelation from God through Scripture where he begins to understand the most important aspect of God, grace. Grace. And thanks be to God that Luther begins to teach that to others. It's God's desire and commitment to love us even in the midst of our sinfulness, in spite of our sinfulness. We are sinner. That is true, Luther would say. But God has dipped 
God's hands into the waters and blessed them and washed us in the waters of baptism and feeds us at the table of mercy and reconciliation and strength and says, I make you a saint. And so we walk now, we live now simultaneously saint and sinner, one in need of forgiveness and one in need to forgive. We've been forgiven so much more than we can ever repay. So much more than we ever deserve that God's call to us is to also forgive. It's a primary part of being in community, of being part of a family, of being in relationship with somebody. Now don't get me wrong. There's consequences to actions. When someone is harmed or property is damaged, there's consequences to pay. Relationships might change some. There are prices to be paid for the hurt that's caused. But if that hurt is held onto by the one who is hurt, then it eats away at us. It causes us more damage than good. And if we are the ones who are causing the hurt, then forgiveness that we don't seek is like having blinders on and not being able to see the destruction that comes in our wake of not seeking forgiveness. You see, there cannot be complete healing or wholeness or relationship without forgiveness. A lot of forgiveness. It's a prerequisite for us feeling whole, whether we are the forgiver or the forgivee. As we live our lives today, we are presented every single day with a multitude of opportunities to hurt one another. And we have even more situations, I think, though, that call us to be disciples of Jesus. And if we remember, Jesus sits down with his disciples toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He sits at a table and he offers them bread and he offers them wine. He blesses that wine and he gives it to them and he lifts it to them and says, drink from this because this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for all people, for forgiveness of sin. It's the only gospel where the forgiveness of sin phrase is added to Jesus' command at the Last Supper. For the forgiveness of sin. Our world today seems to create a lot of hurt and anxiety and division and dissension and arguments and isolation and disparaging remarks and it allows the evil to grow and fester and take root. Perhaps we we're being called in this parable of Jesus to realize just how much we have been forgiven and the nature of that forgiving action. And just perhaps Jesus is calling us to begin and to live each day with a sense of the hope and healing of living in a forgiving community. Seven times? Just seven times, Peter? I challenge you, Peter. How about seven times 70? Amen.
with the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. O oh God, you welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Give us vision for ways to offer Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes and youth ministries. Nurture this new way of ministry for education and faith growth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom, especially in this election year, especially in this time of pandemic, especially in this tragic time of social unrest and violence. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees that are fleeing famine and poverty, war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect, guide, heal all those who are ill, those who are anxious, those who are lonely. Be with those who fight and live in the trauma and the aftermath of wildfires and hurricanes and floods and earthquakes and other natural disasters. Be with those who daily struggle with education today. Give them strength. Give them patience and peace. We pray for those who are in the health field and we pray that you would give them strength as well. Help them to face each day with energy and enthusiasm and let them know that they are appreciated for the efforts they make on our behalf. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, O oh Lord, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we ask that you would help us as we pray in the way in which Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace to be the forgiving and the forgiven. Thanks be to God.